Hello, my friend, and welcome to Securian Secure, hosted by me, Johnny Seifert. This is the Celebrity Mental Health Podcast, or I say it's okay to not be okay. And if you have the same match as me, then whether you're listening or watching, please leave a five-star rating and a review, and let's keep spreading the word, it's okay to not be okay. Now, let me tell you about my guest today. My guest today, you all know, is the finest of the traitors, 2024, which has already defined her 20s. However, before we get there, we need to look at what an inspiration she has been with her superpower as a disability model, showing her stoma bag, and telling you it's okay to not be okay. So without further ado, I'm delighted to talk to you, Skinny It's Molly Pierce. Hello, Molly. Hello, Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on, because you are like <laughs> the star of 2024, and I don't think we're going to have someone who's bigger than you this year. So it's a real honour to be in your presence for this interview. Oh, thank you. I really disagree with that, though. I mean, I know it's done so well, but I still, in my little head, can't believe like how big it actually has got. If you look at the applications for the traitors, already 300,000 people have applied for next year's show, which is just mad to think. How do you even quantify that? I saw that. Thank God that I went on last year, because otherwise <laughs> there's no chance I was getting on there. So, God, I'm really glad I went for it this year. Why do you think you were on it? I don't really know, to be honest. They did reach out to me for season one, and like it just wasn't a good time for me. I was going travelling with my partner, so I kind of just gave it a miss. But I feel like it worked out really well in the end, because obviously this season's done great. Like I knew a little bit more about it going in there. I had a bit more idea of like how I wanted to play the game and stuff, because it wasn't so fresh as season one. So yeah, it worked out really well, but I don't know why I got picked. Honestly, I really don't. Well, we're going to go back to the beginning because obviously we all know what happened on the Traitors. I'm sure you're sick to death of talking about it, even though it was an amazing experience, but it was a long time ago now. So mm -hmm. rather than talk about that, that was a long time ago. Let's go all the way back to the beginning, which was even longer. And let's talk about Molly as a child. So talk to me about school. Who were you in school, Molly? I was kind of confident, but kind of not. Like I was in kind of like a confident group of friends, but I probably was like at the lower end of that scale. If we talk about my disabilities, that's never really affected me in school especially my hand like before my ulcerative colitis I kind of just felt like every other child I knew that I was a little bit different but with my like family and friends it always made me feel just like normal and just like them like I'd never felt like any different to anyone else so I was born with a limb difference so I think my parents found out at like the 24 week scan and that was awful for them because I mean especially going back like 22 years it was even worse than I feel like because there wasn't as much like awareness and it wasn't spoken about as, as much so they found out on the 24 week scan I want to say and then they had like more scans and stuff and they said they couldn't see anything else wrong with me but like they asked if they wanted to terminate the baby anyway because they obviously weren't sure but they kept me and here I am. <laughs> How do you feel knowing now that they had the option, they decided to keep you? Because, you know, we, we have things like Mother's Day and Father's Day and, you know, you celebrate your parents. But do you sometimes feel that you have to overcompensate or do you feel like, no, like I'm like everyone else and therefore, you know, I am a child and I'm allowed to misbehave and I'm allowed to shout at my mum and dad. And yes, they went through a hard time, but also I am a human being at the end of the day. Yeah, I don't think that makes me any different. I mean, they chose to keep me on and this is who I am. Like, yeah, no, definitely not. I think what's interesting about it is obviously they knew about my hand before I was born and that's kind of what they were preparing themselves for. But my hand's given me no problems yet when we look at like my ulcerative colitis and stuff, that was something that was diagnosed sort of in when I was a teen, so I was 11 years old when I got that. No one can prepare you for that because you don't know what's going to happen, if that makes sense. So, and that was like something that affected all our lives so much. When we saw you on The Traitors, and similar to Bryony on The Great British Bake Off a couple of years ago, yeah. your hand never became a definition of you. You know, we didn't mm. know about it unless you knew, unless you could see, and you were like, oh, has she got five fingers? You wouldn't have known. So for yeah. you growing up, what were, I suppose, your coping mechanisms? And if you can answer this question of... of what did you do to overcompensate of not having all your fingers? What were the, your little tips and tricks to get by? Honestly, I think because I was born with it, like that gave me a huge advantage because like I didn't know what it was like. Like I remember people in school used to be like, what's it like to have one hand? Or what's it like to have two hands, babe? Like, I don't know, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't have a clue. I think my parents always used to like, let me try things. So my I've got an older brother and he used to always like, you know, be climbing or whatever he was doing. And I always used to follow him and like copy him because he was my older brother. And my parents didn't like wrap me in cotton wool. They were just like, yeah, you go do it. If you fell, try again kind of thing. Um, and I think that just helped me so, so much. I wouldn't say like I was always fully accepting of it. I definitely sometimes used to hide it when I met new people, like from another school or something like that. and. 
in photos I did like used to have it behind someone's back if I was next to someone or I'd probably put it under my sleeve for a long time but it never really affected me like all that much if that makes sense. Let's talk about that stoma back what were your symptoms that led to you being hospitalized? So when I was like 10, 11, I was diagnosed when I was 11, but I think I started getting my symptoms like eight months before. So yeah, it was a while. And I was just going to the toilet quite frequently. My stools were very loose. I was getting blood in my stools. Um, I had like major urgency when I needed to go to the toilet. And my dad actually has ulcerative colitis, which is super interesting because we literally knew what it was. Like as soon as my symptoms started getting bad, we knew what was wrong with me. And like the doctors just would not listen. They kept like sending me away saying it was like just I had a cut down there and that's why I was bleeding. They said it was an infection and like I was just getting worse and worse and worse. And that's the thing with ulcerative colitis. If you don't treat it, the symptoms do just get worse. And so, so when you say you had a cut down there and you were bleeding, if someone, and mm. we obviously, you're not a doctor, so just put it out there, yeah. but this is based on your own experience. So if someone is bleeding in their stools, is it likely to be this or is it likely that it's a cut or actually it could be neither and it's, there's another reason? It could be neither. There's so many things, you know, bowel wise that could go can go wrong or reasons for having blood in your stools. But it's always better to just get it checked out. I mean, obviously, I can't list all of the diseases it could be or all of the illnesses it could be. But it's definitely better if you see blood in your stools to get it checked out 100 percent. So then you go to hospital and they tell you you're going to have a stoma bag put in and it's going to be there for life. What did that do to your confidence as you said you were born without your second hand working properly whereas this time it was later on when you were already 11 years old trying to find out your identity so how did that affect mm -hmm. you molly so i got diagnosed when i was 11 and i didn't have my surgery till i was 18 so i tried loads of different treatments and stuff um so like with ulcerative colitis you normally go on steroids to get your flare-up under control and then you'll go on treatment if when you're in remission and that hopefully keeps you in remission where for me like nothing ever really worked i think it was like six months at a time i'd be poorly for six months then for six months i'd be on steroids and on treatment and then i'd get ill again it was like it was rubbish, like really, really rubbish. And that affected my life so, so much, like to the point where sometimes I wasn't leaving the house because when my symptoms were bad, I just needed to be around a toilet. I had like really, really bad anxiety, um, especially like as I was getting older, when I was starting to go to college and stuff, I had so much anxiety around having accidents with like not being able to get to a toilet in time that I just couldn't leave the house. Like it was horrible. I remember driving to college, like having these panic attacks just because there was no toilet around me and it was just like the worst thing. But I went into hospital just after my 18th birthday and that was like an omission and they were like really talking about the surgery. And at this point I was like, no way, like I'm not having that. I'd rather die. Like I would rather my symptoms get really, really bad again. There's no way I'm having a bag of poo stuck to me. For, like There's just no way. And then we tried one more treatment that they said probably wouldn't work. And I was back in the hospital like six months later and they were like, look, like we're running out of options. Your colon could erupt. And then it's like emergency surgery then. And that means you're often like completely cut down the middle of your stomach. And obviously there can be more complications because it's not planned um, and stuff like that. And at this point, I think I'd suffered with it for, you know, 11, uh, for seven years. And I just wanted that colon out of me. Like, I just wanted to rip it out of myself. Like, I was so done with it. I was so fed up of having these symptoms, having these panic attacks, always just worrying about where a toilet was. So, yeah, I kind of agreed to the surgery. And that was a massive thing for me because, like, I'd obviously grown up being so against it. Because I found out about it probably when I was, like, 14, 15, I'd say. They started talking about it for the first time. And... It was really scary, to be honest with you, like really scary. But I think I was just at the point where I was just ready to feel better. And like the thought of having a new lease of life was just like, I need to get this colon gone. Um, and I think with my hand, because I've born with it, I like never known any different. Whereas with a stoma, I lived without one. So it was it was a lot harder to get used to, definitely. So how does it work? And in, in the practical sense, in the physical sense, because you're the first ever person I've spoken to who's got a mm -hmm. stone back. So I just want to understand what does it actually mean on a day-to-day -day life? 
So basically what they did, they removed my large intestine, leaving me with my small intestine that sticks outside my stomach. So there's like a hole in my stomach and that's where my small intestine sticks out. And I just put like a stoma bag over it and my waist just naturally leaves my body into the bag. So for me, like I'm always going to the toilet. Like, I could be talking to you right now and be going to the toilet into my bag and I just empty it throughout the day. So how do you know um, when you've been to the toilet? Because you can see the physical stuff in the bag. So for me, so there's there's two different um, like operations. You could have either an illostomy or a col- colostomy. So with an illostomy, which is what I have, that's the small intestine that sticks out. And that kind of just gradually fills up throughout the day. So you wouldn't necessarily just go to the toilet and have to empty it. You kind of just go in throughout the day because it's your small intestine. It's not solid. It's quite runny um, and it just kind of fills up and you can just empty it out the bottom of the bag um, whenever it feels too full, it's getting uncomfortable or anything like that. And then you might have to empty it again a couple of hours later. Whereas with a colostomy, it's your large intestine that sticks out the stomach. So you would go to the toilet into the bag like you would go to the loo, if that makes sense. So you'd probably go like once or twice a day into your bag and then a lot of people with colostomies often just change their whole bag instead of emptying it because it's obviously more of a solid um stool than an where how do you empty and where do you empty it so you just empty it in a normal toilet i to be honest to me it depends what i'm wearing so if i'm wearing like a tight dress i'll normally empty it a little bit more often just so like the bulge isn't showing if it fills up um but like if I'm just at home but chilling out like I will leave it to the last second because I'm just being really lazy um so yeah you just empty it into a normal toilet everyone does it a little bit differently some people kneel down on the floor some people sit on the toilet um it's kind of just whatever you get used to and honestly like I can do it now in probably about 20 seconds because I'm so used to it so actually I get a lot more time in my day because I know a lot of people spend a while on the toilet in the morning so yeah it probably like gives me more hours in the day now and what does it do to your body shape and the way you look at the fitness of your body? Because if it's been put on a certain way, are you allowed to lose weight or put on lots of weight? And also, do you feel yeah. heavy or not? Because, you know, like now, for example, I feel heavy. I always feel heavy because I'm fat. But do you ever <laughs> feel heavy? Because when you've indulged yourself, let's say, on a Saturday night pick a mix and a nice takeaway, do you feel heavy afterwards or do you always feel light? Because it's naturally going in and then just basically coming out straight away afterwards. Uh, it's coming out kind of like the same it would with anyone else though like that might not be my takeaway coming out straight away it could be from yesterday if that makes sense um so yeah I definitely get full like definitely I think for me what I struggled with the most was like when I had my ulcerative colitis I was like so underweight really like I was underweight I wasn't very well but that's how I knew my body like as someone who was very slim and and I'm still slim now but like I did put on weight after my surgery because like I'm healthy I'm you know my body's working as it should like I got my periods back all that kind of thing like my body was working as it should but because I put on weight I did struggle with that a little bit because for years like it had never been a problem but I love food like I've always loved food but when I was ill I couldn't eat food like I could now like I really want it I'd start eating and I'd feel ill so that was like kind of now my love for food is like grown so much I'm like oh I'm actually like turning on weight now I have to think about it but yeah I mean my body works well now like it's healthy and like I kind of just had to train my mind into remembering that like the way I was before wasn't healthy. And as you say you've got your periods back what's the risks of being pregnant or is that a normal thing to be pregnant with a stomach bag? Yeah, so you can be pregnant with a stoma bag. So there is um, surgery to have a reversal for some people. Like I have the option because I had like a small bit of my rectum left. So they basically just left a small bit of um, colon like right down at the rectum. And what they would do if I did have a reversal is another two surgeries. So the first surgery would be to make like a little J pouch out of your small intestine. Cause obviously the colon is where you store your stools before you go to the toilet. So this J pouch would hold stools kind of like a colon, but it would never be as effective obviously. And also your stools are never going to be formed because you don't have your colon anymore. So, yeah, the first surgery would be to get the J pouch and you still have your stoma just so everything can heal up in that J pouch. And like, yeah, you can all heal. And then the third one would be to connect the small intestine back to the rectum. Um, 
but for me like because my symptoms were so bad before I just would never want to go back to that and like I just feel so much happier with a stoma bag having a baby with a stoma is fine and like I follow quite a few people online and like they're amazing and you know they're they're going through pregnancy and they share things but sometimes the reversal can maybe make it harder for you to get pregnant so they do recommend not having the stoma reverse until after you have a family and stuff it's kind of helped me in a way of appreciating my body like I said like I've struggled with like gaining weight and stuff like that but then again like when I look in the mirror I couldn't say oh you look fat or like you know like we all do to ourselves we're all so horrible to ourselves when we shouldn't be but then again like I've got another part of my brain which is like this is giving you your life back, like you're now healthy, you can go do fun things, you can do everything you want to, why are you moaning about it? Like, why are you being negative about your body, which has gone through so much and like giving you your life back? So that I kind of, that kind of switches my mindset sometimes. It's interesting, the maturity, because everyone matures at different ages. That was a big thing you had to do at such an early age and the big decisions that you had to make. So when you look back now in mm -hmm. your 20s and you look back at the younger version of yourself, how proud are you of the teenager that you were, mm -hmm. that you were able to make those decisions with that mature head on you? Yeah, I, I yeah, I am very proud of myself. And my family were amazing. Like, I, I could never have done it without my family. And, like, my dad's obviously got ulcerative colitis. His is very different to mine. Like, everyone's is so different. His can be treated quite easily. Like, medication normally works for him, whereas for me, like, nothing would. And, like, my mum, she... I mean, obviously I was diagnosed when I was 11. She used to sort all my tablets out for me. She'd go to every hospital appointment with me. And yeah, she's just an angel. So very lucky to have them. Oh, <laughs> as you, you're now 22, is that right? Yeah, yeah, just turned 22. Just turned 22. So how are you finding going for your 20s and making up for that lost time? But also thinking of the Molly who, you know, you've been past the 21 age now where everyone's been to university and everyone's now trying to think, how am I taking myself forward? What's the next thing? How am I going to define myself? How are you finding navigating for your 20s? It's hard. I think it's a hard time for everyone. And like, obviously, the last couple of months have just been crazy. Like they've thrown off everything going on the show. But I've always wanted to raise awareness like I always have and I was trying to do it before the show but like this platform has just given me you know so much like more ability to raise that awareness to the scale that I wanted to so I guess I'm just trying to focus on that but I also don't want to make that my whole thing because like there's obviously a lot more to me and like I live day-to-day -day life with a stoma and a limb difference and it doesn't control my life so I don't want to make that everything but I kind of want to show people like just living a normal life with these disabilities. So not always talking about it, but even when I'm like posting photos in like different clothes and stuff like that and like tight dresses, it gives people the confidence like I'm going to be OK if I have a stoma bag, I can still wear what I want. Because like a massive thing for me was thinking I was going to have to change my whole style to like a granny like old fashioned awful like wardrobe but actually within three weeks I think I put some jeans on I like ran down to my mum like, I've got jeans on I've got jeans on and it really doesn't affect anything you can wear that much I mean I probably wouldn't walk around in anything low-waisted one because I'd feel fat and two because obviously my bag would be out but um you could if you wanted to like if you had the confidence there's no reason you can and what are your other passions? And away from the disability, then that's one path that you're going down with your social media. Mm -hmm. What else is important to you at the moment? I'm really enjoying the gym. So I got back into that kind of this year now, probably halfway through last year. And I love it. I think for mental health, like moving your body is so good. And it just reminds you like how much your body can do again. And like it makes you appreciate your body. And yeah, so I've been loving that. And I think the effect that it can have on your mental health is so positive. And um, yeah, maybe getting some more people like moving and being active would be really good as well. Molly Pierce, thank you so much for coming on to Good and Scare with me, Johnny C. But if you love the traitors like I do, there are episodes in the library of Andrew Jenkins from Molly's year, also PJ Kieran and Amanda from season one of the show, all in the Secure the Insecure library right now for you to go and check out. And if you enjoyed today's episode and you learned something, please leave a five star rating and review. And let's keep spreading the word it's okay to not be okay. On social media, I'm on TikTok at Johnny C. For 92, Instagram at Johnny C. For that Secure the Insecure podcast. Molly, where can people find you? on instagram what is my instagram hold mm. is it molly, molly underscore pierce with two e's p-e-a-r-c-e-e -E. molly thank you so much for talking to me on skin i've been johnny seifert until next time thank you and goodbye <laughs>